This is the Ohio Farm Bureau podcast. I'm Ty Higgins. Broadband Ohio Community Accelerator, a collaborative by Ohio State University Extension Community Development in partnership with Broadband Ohio, advancing broadband access for rural Ohioans. Joining us to talk more about the program, Kyle White. She's an extension educator in Medina County with OSU and also community development is her specialty. Also, Defiance County Commissioner David Kern on the podcast. Great to see you both. Welcome in. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Hey, Kyle, let's start with you. Uh, I guess my first question is, we, we've talked about rural broadband for a while. We've known about these grants for a couple of years. Are we making progress on the broadband front across Ohio? We are. We are making progress. We're seeing um, several areas that have increased access to internet and their broadband. Um, I'd like to think thanks to our program that it's helped out. Um, There's a lot of money to Broadband Ohio, and they are doing their best to educate people on the ways to access it and the ways to use it to partner with Internet service providers, also known as ISPs, to bring broadband to everybody in Ohio who desires it. Commissioner Kern, uh, what does broadband access currently, currently look like in your part of the state? Uh, So we are pretty rural, as you had mentioned and alluded to. Uh, it's it's definitely spotty. So as you get into the more rural parts, it's it's um there, there's gaps in coverage. Uh, we do have a wireless you know pro, a, a wireless provider that has some towers you know sp- sprinkled throughout the county. But you know we're, we're we got a lot of tree cover in some areas. But and like I said, we are very rural. So there there's a, a vast amount of area in between those towers, and um it, it's rough. We have. We have pretty pretty low broadband connectivity in certain areas. Um, we even have low cell phone, um, you know, signal in certain areas. I mean, to the point where we have people that have called doing our project and let us know that uh, they have to still to this day they have to drive about half a mile from their home in order to call nine one one, which is a situation that they had just because they couldn't get cell phone signal sig- signal at their home. So it's definitely an issue, something we're working on. Um, it's getting better every day, but uh, we're, we, we got a little ways to go. So you're hearing from constituents that the need is there. Yeah, we, we did a big study along with the OSU um, program. And uh, we had a lot, we had a lot of responses saying that they, they cannot, they still have to drive their you know, COVID kind of shined light on a whole lot of things and the world kind of changed. And I don't think it's going back to the way it was pre-COVID when it comes to how kids do schoolwork or, you know, or people work from home. You know, there's a lot of people who now work from home and probably will continue to do so. Uh, and th- they still aren't able to do that. And, and they're letting us know that it, there's a safety issue to it. There's the economic development issue to it. There's um, the school education aspect to it. And, and obviously farming is, is is huge now. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Kyle, uh, you know, I mentioned the Broadband Ohio Accelerator Program. I do want to take one step back. Can you kind of give us an overview of what Broadband Ohio is? Broadband Ohio was set up, golly, I don't know when um, the date was, but it was before COVID. Um, it's a pro, it's a, it's a department in the, the state of Ohio. Um, they have, it's a very, you know, I would say compact, but mighty group that are working on a number of initiatives um, across the state to enhance broadband um, on all levels. Again, to bring broadband to everybody in the state who desires it. That's their mission and their vision, I think. And I'm speaking for them here now. So um, they may have a different definition, but that's my that's been my experience with them. And they wanted to tap into the extension office because Let's face it, extension offices are in every county. There are 88 counties. We have 88 extension offices. So we have the ability to reach a lot of citizens through our offices. So they partnered with us to bring their their programming to the masses. And we are doing our best to reach out. And I guess I would make an appeal in this broadcast. Uh, We're hoping to set up a very, very productive program in 2025, starting on March 3rd, we're going to have applications going out and the applications are going to be due at the beginning of January. You can go to broadbandohio.com to um, take a look at the application, but we do want members of the farming community to participate 
in the local groups that are going to be meeting and convening to go through these classes. We believe it's going to be very important to have a number of different and diverse um, sectors from the from the local um, community, including healthcare, libraries, education, leaders like Commissioner Kern, and certainly our farm community represented. I did a survey during a Farm Bureau meeting in Medina County asking the farmers how their internet, inter, internet access was. And I used that data for my um, annual um, advisory meetings to kind of you inform us about how the farm community is doing in Medina County. And we are not nearly as um, rural, I don't think, as Defiance County where Commissioner Kern is located. So now you have this partnership uh, called Broadband Ohio Accelerator Program. Walk us through that program, uh, what it looks like and what some of the goals look like. Well, and it's continually evolving, but thanks for that opportunity for us to tell you. Commissioner Kern, when he took the classes, there were 11 weekly classes, one hour of education, one hour of breakouts. We've done extensive surveys of the classes and we've decided to, we're going to bring it down to seven classes in 2025, weekly classes, one hour of education and optional half an hour of breakouts for the small groups. We have, we have subject matter experts speaking in the classes. So we bring in people, uh, inter internet service providers. Uh, we bring in, um, we've brought in before lawyers from different aspects that cover different topics related to internet and broadband. Broadband Ohio will be speaking. They, we bring in ORNET, O-A-R-N-E-T, um, who's been very involved in the education sector and broadband, just bringing this variety of, of experts. Plus, we set everybody up to begin with with a template to take a survey like Commissioner Kern was referring to. So they can survey their communities to find out what the access is and actually to track their individual speeds, um, internet speeds and report those back to us so we can update our broadband map because the broadband maps tend to be um, overly optimistic. Hmm. The numbers are, cre are provided through the internet service providers. So if there's one person in the community that has a really great speed, that will be basically um, used for the entire area as the speed and it's not accurate. So we use these surveys to get compile the data that is then used in funding proposals. Um, you need to have really great data and the surveys provide a good amount of that for the funding proposals that our counties um, then will submit to receive funding along with their internet service providers. You mentioned Commissioner Kern was in one of the classes. Who is it tailored to? Obviously, county leaders, but who else might you find in that classroom setting? We are trying to get as many different sectors as possible. So we do want healthcare because we know that there's telehealth now. We want the educators because of all the remote uh, schoolwork that's being done, business leaders, libraries, a lot of libraries with a lot of access to internet, um, community leaders, uh, we've got government leaders as well, but sometimes you just need people in the community that are going to, we need somebody to take the lead who will can make this sustainable, not just completely dependent on this now seven week class. And then once the class is over, the whole initiative stops. So we're looking for people that are really dedicated to keep it moving. And we want to provide the support to them, all the support that we can to push them over the goal line. Commissioner Kern, she mentioned you took part. Uh, how did you find out about the program, first of all, and, and why did you decide to take part? You know, we actually, uh, we were kind of one of the unique participants in, in, in the the very first one as we had already started uh, our own study. We had, we had hired an outside consultant and started an RFP study um, to, and doing our own survey. And when this came along, we just kind of came across it through uh I, I do believe it was through email or some, some type of correspondence. And uh, our clerk and I were like, you know, we need to, we need to jump on this and, and see if, if we can tag team this along with our own study that we had going on with our own consultant. And we jumped in and um, it was a great experience, 100% worth it. Uh, what the accelerator program was teaching us was exactly the information we were finding along with our, 
um, consultant. So we knew the information was factual and the direction that we were heading in and the community accelerator program itself was heading in was the right direction. I mean, it, and it's uh, 100% great value. What were some of those takeaways and, and how will you use what you learned through the commissionership uh, that you're in today? Uh, some of those takeaways were obviously the fact that, you know, broadband's needed. It, it is needed. Uh, and the fact that uh, broadband isn't just for, it's not just for fun. It's not for leisurely, you know, getting on Google or, or playing video games at home. It it affects every aspect of our life from from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you're using connectivity somehow, whether it be checking your phone, checking the weather for the next day, uh, making any type of phone call for the most part, not any, any work, any school work, um, everything. It affects everything. And it goes all the way to the you know economic development side, the, the, the quality of life. Um, broadband is infused in everything that we do nowadays. Everybody has an Alexa or Google in their home and Ask said, what time is it? Or, you know, what's, what's four plus four, Alexa? And, and my, <laughs> my kids are cheating on their homework a little bit, but, um, nah. but you know, it, it's, it's there it, it, and it's there to stay. And just how deep broadband goes, uh, it was, it was pretty eye opening to go through this study and probably one of the biggest takeaways and most impactful one for us being a rural County is the whole piece of precision ag, which I think you said we will allude to, um, Knowing that that desire was there from some of our local leaders and, and some of our farmers that they're, they're moving in that direction and they wanted it. They just didn't know how to pursue it. And we opened that door for that communication to help solve that problem. So that, that was a great experience. And being able to make those connections uh, was probably the most valuable part of the, of the connections. Yeah, Kyle, you know, I think the technology in ag has maybe outpaced the broadband availability, and that's something you're hoping to yeah. turn around relatively quickly. Absolutely, Ty. I mean, we we know that the need is out there, and we know some of the roadblocks. We realize that there's a lot of cost involved when you've got um, locations that are so remote and so separated by miles and they've got a, you know, how are you going to do it? Are you going to do it through, um, cable? Are you going to do it through, you know, receivers? I, I can't even begin to say all the options. I think I told you earlier before we were taping that, um, broadband Ohio has all of these brainiacs that have the answers. But the great, great thing that they're offering to all of us is access to them. And they're very, very um, aggressive in trying to get out into the community. That's why they partnered with Ohio State Extension. They knew that they needed to reach people at the basic levels. Because let, let's face it, if you're taking a survey on the internet and you don't have good internet, you might not even receive the notice about the, 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 the request that we want to know your internet speeds. So we have to reach people that are kind of hard to reach via internet and um, broadband is using extension to get there. Commissioner Kern, what's the outlook for Defiance County as far as broadband expansion is concerned? Yeah, we're, we're doing pretty good. Uh, the providers themselves have really stepped up uh, and, and started building their own infrastructure and in the time in between us going for our RFP and, you know, there, there's been kind of a lull due to the, the grant structures that are out there and deadlines and everything kind of being formed and trying to figure out how those grants and, you know, between the Orbeg and the bead money, how they're going to mesh together. Um, so there's been some delays, but the providers have stepped up. I think the least of what happened is the fact that we sparked the providers to know that, okay, this is, we, we got to get this in check, kind of put them on notice a little bit. Um, obviously they're for profit entities and they got to do what they got to do to, to sustain themselves. Um, but let them know that, Hey, we want to be a partner and we want to help get this going as fast as we can. Um, that was well received. So we're going, we're, we're moving. Like I said, we still got a long way to go. It'll you know, be a couple, couple year process. And that's kind of what we stated through our, our survey and our, and uh, all of our community meetings was, you know, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes a while to put that fiber in the ground or to hang it on the pole. And, you know, government has its, you know, in, you know, in, inefficiencies, I, I guess I can say. <laughs> so you take that into consideration, but 
we're moving ahead and I don't, I don't think, I don't see us slowing down. It's, I think it's going to be full go and, until we're, until we got fiber to every, every premise in Defiance County. And, and that's the ultimate goal is fiber by, they don't have to tap in, but we want the fiber there if they want to tap in. Kyle, you made uh, one of your pitches earlier in this conversation. I'll have you make another one. So if those of us joining us right now, how can they find out more about the Broadband Ohio Accelerator Program? You can contact Broadband Ohio at broadbandohio.com. They will have the applications for this program on their websites, uh, on their website. And we are really hoping that we can get people, again, from every sector, farm community, the telehealth, the, the healthcare, the um, educators, the libraries. We need some people to step up in these counties, particularly those where they have very spotty, similar to Defiance County, internet coverage. We want to reach as many counties as we possibly can. So contact Broadband Ohio to get that application. The applications are going to be um, due in, I think, in January. I'm not sure the date now because we're starting March 3rd. So the, the actual application may be released January 1st, but keep your eyes on the Broadband Ohio website. And again, we we want leaders that are going to push this over the goal line. So help us get the, a sustainable effort going in your county. We'll put that link on our website and as a description of this podcast as well at ohiofarmbureau.org. Kyle White, educator with OSU Extension in Medina County, her focus on community development and Defiance County Commissioner David Kern joining us on the podcast. Great to see you both and thanks for the conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, appreciate you having us. Sometimes out here, you have to speak loudly. Our voice alone may not have as much impact as we would like. But my voice. And my voice can be heard and influential through membership in Ohio Farm Bureau. My voice, along with tens of thousands of Ohioans, makes a difference when it comes to legislation, regulation, or litigation that can be positive or potentially harmful to those of us in the agriculture community. Become a member today at OhioFarmBureau.org. Because there is strength and members. Find out how Nationwide Agribusiness can help you grow your business. Get to know the people with the experience and knowledge to help you. Whether you are looking to protect your farm or ranch from the ground up, or need someone who understands your changing commercial ag needs. Find out how to better manage the risks of your ag business, or how quickly you can get back to business. Learn how you can protect your next with Nationwide on your side. Not many farmers look forward to the estate planning process, but it's massively important in maintaining valuable farm assets and property for farmers and farm business owners. A farm succession plan should include a few key components that preserve an estate for future generations. To talk more about it and have this difficult conversation is George Shine, Technical Director with Nationwide Retirement Institute and a sixth generation farmer of a farming family dating back to the 1870s. So obviously he and his family have had this conversation a few times as well. George, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much. Happy to be back. So what goes into a good farm estate plan? And in, in one word, I would say a lot. Uh, and when, when I say a lot, I, what I mean is uh, documentation. So you're speaking to uh, a licensed attorney. And um, as an attorney, I can tell you that I'm not giving legal advice, but just letting you know that in gener generalities, a lot of documentation goes into the creation of a detailed succession, a farm succession plan. And I'm sort of trying to parse my words carefully because we, you can use the term an estate plan, which I think of in terms of tax planning, efficient tax planning, specifically in regards to the estate tax. Um, because remember, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act doubled the estate tax, but it sunsets after next year. And so it's going to go from close to 14 million uh, through 2024 or 2025, but then back down to around 7 million, which is the 2017 limit adjusted for inflation to 2026. And so that's something that a lot of farmers now, um, when you take land values into consideration, something to think about. So you have the estate plan, uh, then you, but then you have really the transition plan and the farm succession plan. And um, when we're talking about that farm succession plan, uh, there are a lot of documents that you might want to think about in terms of appraisals, in terms of potentially life insurance um, documents and beneficiary designation forms that might help fund a, a transfer of uh, 
of wealth and a transfer of land in some instances. Um, you have um, a power of attorney. That's another really important document. You can have one that combines both medical um, and sort of more business, more financial powers of attorney. Um, you have um, healthcare, uh, as I mentioned before, um, like do not resuscitate orders. There's just a myriad of, of documents that you might want to think through. I'm thinking also um, of just a basic will and or a trust that might also be needed. And all of those, um, all of those are different, so different specific pieces of paper that should be um, separate, but part of a cohesive plan. I mentioned the challenge of just starting the conversation and having it with that next generation, but what are some of the other common challenges as far as succession planning is concerned for farm families? So you, you bring up the good point that just right off the bat, it's never fun to talk about death and what comes next. And, you know, a lot of times it, it's not a, it's not a fun topic um, to think about or to talk about. But then you have to sort of get over that, uh, that discomfort to really analyze details. So how many, if let's say it's a baby boomer farming parent who's in, at this point, their 60s, maybe their 70s, and the, their children, and let's say there's a number of children that are Generation X or maybe elder millennials, and maybe only one of them farms. I think of my own dad. Um, he was one of four kids. Uh, he, he, he was the only one of the four to farm with his dad. And, um, you know, it's an awkward discussion to think about the, the finances and really also, you know, one of those things you learn, you don't really ask people what they make and you don't really talk about that type of thing in polite conversation. But when you know, at Thanksgiving, when all four of the siblings are there, you have to find some time to talk about um, how much is the farm worth? And if it's all wrapped up in land and equipment and only one farms, what happens when that baby boomer or uh, dies? And how is that estate sep separated and divided? And you know, it, it, it brings in finances and it brings in, you know, how di different individuals make a living and, you know, how they feel maybe inheriting less than what they think they should. And so um, it, it it brings in a lot of sensitive topics, not not just in terms of death, but also in terms of finances and then in terms of just relationships, right? Because a lot of times the older generation, they maybe they don't want to work as much, but they still want to make all the decisions. And you might have, you know, a 50, 60 year old farmer who's still taking instructions from an 80 year old who doesn't, uh, you know, isn't mobile enough to get off the, the back porch that much. You mentioned the relationship part. That's obviously uh you know, components to this conversation. You also mentioned the legal parts and the financial parts. Uh, so you're right. getting people that maybe aren't a part of the family into these conversations, into that kitchen around the table to have these conversations. Who uh, are the right people to have involved when it comes to planning the farm's future? So in terms of the family members, any family member that is working on the farm and contributing to the farm's success as well as any family member that, you know, maybe it's the spouse that is also depending on income from the farm to survive, to, to make a living. Um, and so you have those, all of those family members, if they're either contributing and or receiving funds uh, from the farm. And then you also have, hopefully, uh, if you're planning well in advance, you want experts, you want qualified experts. That normally is hopefully going to entail a, a local uh, attorney that is familiar with your family and that is familiar with uh, the intricacies of estate planning and, and the agricultural industry. You've got, so you've got that estate attorney. A lot of times you will have and probably should have a financial advisor that also is familiar with um with more rural communities and how, um, how, how farmers plan their financial futures. I would say it might make sense um, in, in a worst case scenario, you might also have to bring in 
like an arbitrator or mod a moderator if you've got maybe some younger siblings that can't agree or that if there's a lot of contention over certain issues. You um, may or may not also have a separate CPA if the farm, you know, if, if, if you hire a CPA that to do the taxes every year, you might want to bring them to the table. And then maybe you have a certain bank that you always work with. Um, there may or may not be someone from that bank that um, maybe, maybe they, you don't have to bring them all into the same room and have them there at the single meeting, but definitely you want all of their input um, when making when making big decisions that concern succession planning and planning planning for that that transition. If you haven't even started this conversation, uh, what you're talking about can seem daunting, but there is a resource out there through Nationwide to really help families get a grasp of what a succession plan looks like and entails. Tell us more about that and, and how people can find out more about that resource. There is. There is a program within the Nationwide Retirement Institute. It's very close colleagues of mine work for the Land is Your Legacy program. And that is a really helpful uh, team of individuals um, that really work with farms and agribusinesses across the country to help develop very detailed and um, action-oriented um, succession plans that help those farms and ranches and agribusinesses really have detailed plans in place so that uh, those farms can transition from one generation to the next and remain um, you know, financially viable enterprises that and that stay in family hands. It's What's a, that um, go ahead, George. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's 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 uh, um, more information about the program uh, can be found at nationwide.com/aic, and that AIC stands for the Agricultural Research Center. But once you get there, um, you can find more information about the Land as Your Legacy program. We you know provide a number of, of sort of fact finder slash questionnaires. They're completed. Um, our, our colleagues, you know, analyze the the responses, and then really we'll we'll sit down with individuals to help them plan, uh, help them plan through next steps. We'll put that link on the description of this podcast for the Land as Your Legacy resource through Nationwide. George Shine, Technical Director with Nationwide Retirement Institute, our guest here on the podcast. Always great to see you, and thank you for the insights. Thanks again for having me.